Welcome everybody, my name is Matthew Kaiser uh, and today I will be talking about DNA Star software and analyzing some variations in a cancer data set. Uh, we'll start today with a little introduction to DNA Star as a company. Uh, DNA Star is located in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, we have this uh, nice picture of a, a summertime shot. I guarantee you it's much colder than that uh, here today. It's cold and rainy, unfortunately. Um, but uh, Madison is centrally located. If you haven't been here before, um, our sales team is here. Our developers are here. Um, and uh, we've been a long-standing company for, for quite a few years. Uh, our, our founder is Dr. Fred Blattner, uh, who founded uh, uh, DNA Star back in the 1980s. So, so we're really a, a long-term player uh, in bioinformatics software. Uh, we have solutions for uh, life scientists uh, that include Sanger sequencing and next-gen sequencing platforms. And we design software for desktop computers um, and, and Linux computers as well if you're, if you're doing uh, large-scale assemblies. Um, and we also more recently have some offerings up on the cloud. So, um, you know, depending on what your needs are, uh, we may uh, certainly have some uh, software for you. So DNA Star software is research grade. Uh, it's been uh, used again back since the 1980s and used for scientists to analyze sequence data and create publications. And for the past 28 years, we've been the most cited um, software company for sequence analysis. Uh, and you can see that our next nearest competitor has less than half of the citations. So, so it's really a goal of ours to produce software that is easy to use, uh, yet powerful enough to um, do the analysis that you need. So one of the first questions that will come up with desktop software is whether or not it's powerful enough to handle the data sets that um, that, that, that you may be generating with your next-gen sequencing instruments. And for the past few years, we've really developed uh, some of our own algorithms um, that can optimize the latest uh, uh, hardware and produce very, very good assembly times. And just to give you an idea, uh, human genome, for instance, see, I'll try my little arrow tool here. Um, Human genomes uh, take about 12 hours from start to finish time. Uh, in this assembly time of, uh, on this computer, 13 hours, uh, this is uh, over a billion reads, nearly 40x coverage. And this is not just an alignment, but it's also a full gapping of the assembly, producing BAM file outputs, doing all the statistical SNP analysis. And so this assembly time is really, um, you know, not just a mapping. A lot of times when we look at benchmarks, it's just how long does it take to map reads to a reference, but this is actually producing all the output files, so it's, it's ready to go uh, for you uh, to do analysis. So it's really an excellent time. Um, exomes uh, are more variable, but it's roughly two hours per exome. Um, some of the later versions of our software are, are dipping under two hours. Here's a, a, a data set of eight exomes that were assembled together, and an average is a little bit under two hours per exome. So again, very, very um, powerful assembler running on a desktop computer. Uh, a data set that we'll look at today is a, an ion torrent AmpliSeq cancer panel, which is a very deeply sequenced uh, um, gene panel with a couple of million reads, and the coverage is, uh, can exceed 500x. And we measure this in minutes, so it's you know it's just a few minutes to do the assembly. And then things like RNA seq and smaller projects, again, uh, we measure those in minutes. So the type of hardware, so, so you're, you, if you're thinking about doing your own assemblies um, rather than maybe having a core facility assemble for you, or if you are a small core, a core, and you, and you want to produce an output file that your researchers can use more easily, um, one of the first considerations that you'll have is the type of hardware that you would need to invest in. Um, again, our, our goal is typically to design software that really um, is accessible to a researcher. So we, we design it to run on computers um, that are economical, you know, not, not supercomputers that cost $20,000. Uh, we shoot for computers that cost for under $2,000. And, uh, and this little schematic just shows you an optimal hardware configuration. And so, you know, if after the presentation today um, you're interested in a demo, you definitely want to just double check and make sure you have the, the kind of hardware in place. And what we generally recommend is a core computer that has a processor between four and eight cores. Um, you know, 16 gigs of RAM, 
and you have adequate storage. This could be on a network drive or you know, it could be a local drive on your computer. Um, and when we're doing alignments to human genomes, really what's, what's key is uh, having enough scratch disk space. And, and this varies. It can be as little as one terabyte, you know, as much as four terabytes of space. And the algorithm utilizes this scratch disk space to process the temporary files that are generated during the assembly. So it's real, really key to have a drive dedicated to handling those temporary files. And, and these days, of course, it's economical. You can plug in a drive into a laptop. Um, you can stick another drive. I, I have a laptop where I pulled the CD-ROM drive out and replaced it with an SSD drive. So I can do these assemblies on my laptop. So again, um, it's economical um, and you can get great performance. You know, the benchmarks that we're looking at, that's done on a computer that's under $2,000. So, so really minimal hardware um, to get maximal performance. Another thing to consider with, uh, with software is the level of support that you're gonna receive with that software. And what I'm showing here is just a, a, a screenshot of the DNA Star website. And all these, you probably can't see them on your screen, but all these little green links, these are videos, and you can see some are overviews and ion torrent and pack bio and Illumina. Uh, these are videos that are generally three to four minutes long. Some of the overviews are longer, and they cover specific topics. And so our customers utilize these heavily. If they just have a question about a certain um, you know, certain workflow, they can usually find a video in a couple of minutes. Um, they'll understand, you know, how to, how to do their workflow. And so as part of our, our software offering, we provide support that's online, um, like these videos. Um, we also do one-on-one -on -one webinars, so kind of like we're doing today, except we might look at your project together um, and work through, you know, whatever issue or, or questions that you have. So we really provide the, the best possible support for our customers. Um, webinars are also uh, scheduled on a about a monthly basis, and and so you'll uh, if you sign up for a newsletter, you'll be notified of uh, different uh, webinar topics. Uh, some of these are next gen topics. Uh, some of these are regular, uh, you know, just your basic sequence editing and, anal and analysis. Uh, we had a webinar uh, just recently on Megaline Pro, one of our, our new applications, and I did an advanced SNP analysis back in August. So. So these are, again, these are hour long. They're great to check out. Um, so the software that we're gonna talk about today is primarily the LaserGene Genomics Suite. Uh, the LaserGene Genomics Suite, for those of you who are familiar with DNA Star software, includes a portion of the core LaserGene product that, that we've sold here for you know, 20 plus years, uh, plus the addition of our SeqMan engine assembler that we'll look at today, and then the advanced analysis tools in ArrayStar. And we also have other packages if you're, if you're not doing next-gen projects. We have you know, uh, multiple sequence alignment packages and protein and structural biology and the protein folding packages. So again, depending on your needs, we do have different software packages available to you. So the, the type of next-gen projects that we support are, are wide-ranging. They include genome resequencing, um, exome and targeting resequencing, RNA-seq, de novo transcriptome, uh, this is just a partial list. You know, we do things like viral integration sites, uh, metagenomic assemblies, and so a real difference between SeqMan Engine, our assembly, our assembler software, and uh, say an open source program is that it's very flexible. So, you know, if your needs are more diverse, if you're doing you know cancer analysis plus you're doing some viral analysis or um, you know maybe some some other kind of microbial analysis. Uh, our software can accommodate all those different workflows. So it's really a solution that can take the place of many different assembly programs. So today we're going to be talking about uh, targeted resequencing. And what targeted resequencing means is, you know, aligning to a template sequence and doing variant analysis. To, well, oftentimes it's comparing individuals to other individuals or a control genome or, uh, or con comparing sets. And so the software has to be, able to be flexible enough to accommodate, you know, different numbers of samples. And so, you know, for example, uh, you know, you may have one or two samples where it's just normal versus a tumor sample, which would be fairly common in a, in a, a cancer study or a pedigree analysis, which is usually some cohorts um, or a family analysis. Uh, and then association studies where you're fishing for variants of interest in a population. So you may have sequenced, you know, 
several hundred individuals, you know, exomes or gene panels, and you want to find out, you know, statistically which variants are um, are interesting, you know, amongst that population. So our software has a variety of different uh, sample handling uh, capabilities and filtering options to allow you to do uh, these different um, uh, types of analyses. So one of the first challenges with uh, targeted resequencing is really filtering through, you know, the massive amount of, of uh, noise that can be in next-gen sequencing data sets. And a lot of times, you know, if you have some pipeline software, some of the filters are kind of hardwired in place. You might not be aware that, you know, with, oh, with ion torrent or with Illumina data, that there's a lot of kind of uh, background noise. And some of the pipeline software kind of automatically separate that and just kind of pick a, a parameter. Uh, what's a little bit different with our software is we give the, the end user um, all the controls so that you can run an assembly without any filters first. And that's usually a, you know, a nice thing to do. See, you know, if I don't do any, any filtering at all, how many variations do I have? And then you can start to apply more stringent filters and, and, and get a good feel for, you know, when you apply a filter, um, you know, where the noise drops out and where you start to pick up signal, you know, is there an overlap there? Is there a sensitivity limit to, to my, my workflow? So what I'm going to show you today I actually spends, you know, a fair amount of time I'll discuss, you know, how we apply some of those filters and, and how we go from a large pool of variants down to a much smaller pool of variants. So the workflow today um, is in our genomic suite, and we're going to start with some AmpliSeq um, cancer data, data uh, sets. And we have three data sets, and, and we'll align these to a human genome reference. And this is done in our SeqMan engine software. So SeqMan engine is the starting point, uh, and then the output from SeqMan engine is a BAM.assembly file. So I could actually have drawn this picture differently. Uh, depending on what your needs are, you may take that BAM.assembly file and go into SeqMan Pro, which is what we're going to do today, or we could go to ArraySTAR, or, or you might have another program that reads BAM files, and you might plug the BAM files into, you know, another program to do your analysis. Um, but we're going to kind of keep a linear flow. SeqMan Engine will do the assembly. SeqMan Pro allows us to visualize that assembly and do some SNP evaluation. Um, and then ArraySTAR allows us to import you know, anywhere from one to hundreds of assemblies, and we can bring them together. You know, in this case, it could be cancer and control or different individuals, and bring them all into ArraySTAR and then use ArraySTAR to find candidate genes or, or SNPs of interest. So we'll start in SeqMan Engine, and what we're looking at here is uh, the project setup wizard for SeqMan Engine. It's not a, a true program in the sense that there's no file menus here. I'm not opening and saving files, I'm not editing files. Uh, it's a project setup wizard that allows me to, um, to set up a wide variety of projects with a wide variety of sequencing platforms. And the design of SeqMan Engine is such that, you know, it's meant to be for a novice user. You know, if, if you've never done an assembly before, I've had people that have never worked with next-gen sequence data and the first time that they try SeqMan Engine, they get a great assembly. And, that, and that's really the goal. We constantly tweak this interface, you know, to find any, any areas that are potential problems for customers. And we just try to make it as foolproof as possible. Um, and, and while doing that, we also um, provide advanced options. So once you're an experienced user, you can start to um, make some changes and change some default parameters to, to improve your assemblies. So we'll start by creating a new project. And we can choose the project type, and you can see here we have some viral host integration, metagenomic and 16S RNA, um, miRNA, uh, transcriptome and RNA-seq assemblies, targeted resequencing, genome. Um, and today we're, we're going with the targeted resequencing. And of course, as you make selections here, and so we have our selection here, targeted resequencing. But if I were to select another workflow, um, that actually starts to set um, different default parameters in the algorithm automatically. You know, a metagenomic sort, so taking data and aligning to 5,000 bacterial genomes at, all at one time is a very different assembly than aligning sequence data deeply to um, some gene target. So a little bit different flavor of the algorithm um, that allows for this flexibility. But you don't need to know what's under the hood. You just click your workflow and next. 
and provide a project name and uh, the folder for the output files. There's also a temporary file location. Uh, this goes back to that scratch disk that we were talking about with the hardware. And this is the point that you specify the drive that you have dedicated to handle temporary files. And this is very important. It's a, it's a data flow to this, this, this uh, drive. Um, really has a large impact on the overall speed and efficiency of the assembly. So it's an important thing to, to note. Um, uh, then we select our input files. Uh, I've selected a .genome template package here. And this genome template package is downloadable from the DNA Star website. So there's a link here that goes right to our website. Um, we create genome template packages for all the model organisms. Uh, so we have human and mouse and rat and pig and cow and uh, uh, C. elegans and Arabidopsis. So it's so a whole host of organisms. And the genome template packages contain DNA sequences plus um, DB SNP information. I can show you here's the, uh, the, the, the website. So we have uh, zip files that you can download. Um, and we update these on a regular basis. So these uh, packages will be um, with, with a different release cycle between genome builds and DB SNP packages. So you can see here we've got the DB SNP build um, and then the assembly name. Um, so it's, it's a pretty active process to keep up with all the different packages. And, and if there's an organism that you don't have, um, there are still options for you. You know, you can request that we build a package for you. Uh, we also have a means of uh, um, creating a package de novo from a novel organism. And what these packages are containing then is all the DB SNP information, um, the cosmic database, the GERP database, uh, and we provide this in a package so that when the data is assembling, um, all this information is known to the assembler. So our assembler starts to do statistical SNP analysis um, as the data is streaming through. So if you know where there's you know, um, uh, reference SNPs, you can start to apply the statistics in that data path. So it makes it a more efficient process to do assembly and um, variant calling when you have these packages. Uh, once we've selected our reference, now I should also mention, uh, you don't have to use a genome package. You could have a set of genes that you have targeted um, another uh, set of amplicons and FAST or GenBank format. So you can use other um, genomes uh, in addition to the packages. So once you've, you've specified your, your template files, uh, then you can specify the input files. And so there's a read technology option here, um, and I've selected ion torrent. And then we have some more options about how we want to set up the project. So I've loaded in, in this case, some, some FASTA files. Um, and there's three files here. And I'll call them FAS, CUR, and SIR. And these three files are in the FASTA format. And I have an option here for how I want the assembler to, to process these samples. So first of all, it's multiple sample. So I check the box, multiple sample data. And then there's a, a button that I can customize the sample names if needed. Uh, we'll also, uh, engine will take a guess looking at the file name or the folder name and assign a group name. And so that's how you keep track of the different samples. Uh, and then I have an option to run these as separate projects. And what that means is generate a separate assembly package for each sample. So maybe I have 100 samples, and my intention is to go to a Raystar and you know, uh, look for SNPs that are in common between my 100 samples. right? So I'm, I may not look at all 100 assemblies. I just want to associate. So I might say, run these as separate projects right here. Or I might say, I'd like to look at them all together. You know, I've got three samples. Um, let's align them in one project so I can visualize the assembly together with the assemblies stacked up on top of one another. So it gives us some options on, on how to do that. Um, and so this is an important piece in uh, setting up the project. We have also, I should mention, there's unpaired and paired reads. Uh, we can handle both. If you have a combination of paired and unpaired, you can load them in as well. It doesn't matter. So the assembly options then are, uh, we, we have some default options and some advanced options. So again, for the new user, you load your data in. There's some assembly options, and I won't go into great detail in here, but there's MER size, which is common to most assemblers, minimum match percentage, which really sets the stringency of the project, and the default is at 93%. If I increase that number to, say, 97%, I've just made a much more stringent uh, assembly. 
and that means the percent of the read must match the template in order to align. And so if you're going to fiddle with one parameter, uh, that's the one to do, minimum match percentage. And that will give you the most dramatic impact on the output assembly. So it's, it's one nice uh, control to have access to. We also uh, provide the general employee, and that's for the statistical SNP caller and for the, um, for the genotyping calls. Uh, you need to provide the employee of the genome. And then there's also some advanced options. So I click this button and bring up the advanced options. And I, I didn't show there's layout and alignment, more knobs and dials that we could adjust to tweak the assembly. Again, in a, in a reference guided assembly, it's quite rare when a customer even has to go into those areas. You know, it's, it's got, there's got to be some um, unusual aspect to a data set to, to fiddle with those parameters. Um, but the SNP options are, uh, that's an area that we do occasionally go into. And, and I'd like to point this out that um, one of the first steps in removing sequencing noise from the data sets is to apply some upfront filters right at the assembly. And a couple of these are things like minimum SNP percentage. So by default, SNPs that occur at less than 5% are uh, removed from the analysis, right? But I could change this. I might say, well, I'm looking for rare variations. You know, they might only occur at 0.1%. So I can undo this parameter and put zero there, and, and then there's no minimum filter and SNP percentage. And then confidence threshold, which is the p-score, I can filter there. And you can see these are just really minimal filters. You know, this isn't very stringent. But what it does is it removes, you know, on the largest data sets, like whole human genome, you know, this can remove millions of sequencing errors from the SNP files. It makes them a lot more manageable. So that's kind of the first level of filtering. Again, usually we just go with the default, and we don't even open up that dialog. So once we've set up our project, uh, everything is ready to begin. Uh, what we're looking at here is the final window in Seekman Engine, and the text that's there is a script, and the script is the instruction for the assembler. And you can see that I can save the script as well in the upper right-hand corner, and that saves out as a text file. And I can save that script file um, and use it a couple different ways. One, if I'm a command line user, and I, I'm comfortable with command line, I can take this script and run it in the command line. And uh, there's some advantages there. If, if, for example, you need to run 50 assemblies, you know, over the weekend, uh, you can you can uh, thread multiple scripts together and run 50 different assemblies over the weekend. You know, so so it gives some a uh, little more flexibility for some of the more advanced users. And then when I click assemble, I can watch the progress in this window. It's a log then, and I can just watch the log uh, and wait for the assembly to complete. So it's a it's a nice way to kind of monitor what the assembly is doing at any, any given point in time, this log will update here in this window. And uh, it's also something I can send to tech support. So if there's a problem in the assembly, I can send the script file, I can send this log, there'll be a button that says export the log. Um, and that's very useful for just troubleshooting. You can see exactly you know, where there was a problem and then correct your problem very quickly and, and get you back uh, uh, on your way. So one of the first things, so when we're done with the assembly, there's a button here to, um, to open the project in Seekman Pro. And Seekman Pro then will take the band.assembly file and allow us to visualize it and start doing the analysis. And so one of the things that we might do, and we won't talk about uh, structural variations very much, but I might want to look at structural variations. And Seekman Pro can generate a report based off of the alignment that was just done to find potential um, deletions, insertions, and other indels. And this is an interactive report, so I can click on a place in the report and go to that place in the assembly and verify, you know, is this an insertion or deletion, or is this a potential, you know, misassembly or some other issue that's occurring. And so it gives us a reference position length and um, coverage and feature. Um, and then we can look at, use Seekman Pro to actually go and look at that point in the assembly. And this is, uh, this is uh, the Seekman strategy view that we're looking at here. The strategy view is kind of like a genome browser type view. Um, these red and green uh, lines here are features. So these are gene features. And you can see there's some exons right here. And we have a coverage histogram. So this coverage histogram, which is red, is a peak of sequence coverage. So you can see we have coverage of you know 600x deep, and 
uh, a bunch of pink colored reads. And these pink colored reads are reads that map to either side of a potential deletion. And so it's a, a the, the Seekman engine assembler will detect if a read actually splits and maps on either side of a structural variation. So we can go and use that structural variation report, um, which interacts with this view, look at the aligned data, and identify structural variations. And it's got a really nice resolution for a lot of structural variations. Um, it can is a great tool for discovering you know novel variations in your data set. Um, of course, uh, one of the primary interests will be analyzing SNPs. Uh, and this is a multiple sample. So this is a, a, an engine assembly that I set up where I did not run the three samples as separate projects. Um, I aligned them all together in a, in a single project. And what we're looking at here is the sequence alignment view now in Seekman. And the sequence alignment view, up on top we have a, a reference genome sequence. And so this is one of the chromosomes, and you can see, you know, these these are feature annotations that are all displayed. And just below that, these yellow highlighted regions, these are the three samples. Right? And those yellow areas are the pseudo consensus. And so I can collapse them all down. So if I have, you know, 20 samples, I can collapse by clicking on these arrows and just look at the pseudo consensus, which shows me the SNP calls that are highlighted in blue. So I can you know, if I have a certain gene of interest or a point in interest, I can quickly look and see which of my samples have a SNP at that location and which ones do not. And then I can also expand, look at the aligned data. I can scroll back and forth. So it's this interface that Seekman provides that's really quite unique. It's a, it's a really nice user experience um, because I can open up all these samples, you know, multiple exomes, multiple panels, look at the data, confirm SNPs and have a high degree of confidence that in my assembly, you know, I'm detecting SNPs and, you know, and not sequencing, sequencing noise. So there's, uh, to navigate through SNPs, there's a SNP report. And so rather than just scrolling through an assembly, uh, which works okay if you're looking at one or two genes, but if you're looking at whole chromosomes, um, you know, it's, it's not very efficient. So we also have a, a SNP report. And the SNP report make this a little bit bigger for myself here. So the SNP report is um, interactive with the alignment views. And so if I click on any one of these rows, which is a separate variant, it will bring me to the sequence alignment view. And I can go between different chromosomes. And we can see, I'll just uh, uh, draw some arrows here, um, but there is uh, filters at the top and we have information at the bottom. And each column contains uh, a different a piece of information about the variant and each row is a separate variant. Okay, and then the filters at the top are the controls that the user has to now filter for some of the SNPs. And so we can see, you know, the number of SNPs that are present and in, in, in the number of columns that are present. And let me actually undo that. So we can see there's uh, 37 SNP columns rejected and, you know, how many have been filtered out. And so we can keep track of the number of SNPs that we have, you know, in this view. And the different filters at the top can include things like um, depth of coverage. And we can have a minimum and max SNP percentage um, as well. We have uh, over here show coding change SNPs. So I can, if I have an annotated reference, I can differentiate between SNPs that cause a coding change, SNPs that do not. Um, show all SNPs. So these are SNPs that are both in DB SNP and SNPs that are potentially novel. And so by applying different filters, probability, p not ref, um, I can really filter down and focus on those variants of interest. And what I mentioned earlier is that what's nice about um, Seekman software is that I can start very uh, with, with allowing almost all the variations or all the sequencing errors into the project and get a good feel for you know how much sequence noise do I have. And where do I really start losing uh, my signal? You know, how, how much can I actually filter without risking, you know, losing some signal? So it's a, it's a really nice interface to, to experiment with that. Now the different rows, if we start from the left, we have the MID, that's a sample name, and then, you know, contact ID, reference position, the type, whether it's a SNP or an indel. You can see they're colored pink. The reason for that is those are, these are coding, these are SNPs that cause coding changes. So they, we actually color them pink as well. 
and there's a reference base and a, and a call base and the genotype and the impact on the protein, whether it's in a homopolymer. Um, here's SNP percent here, you know, p value here. And then what I've got boxed in here are so, some database information that came from the genome template package. So the advantage uh, to having a genome template package is that you get these other columns. You get RS numbers for dbSNP, you get the cosmic ID numbers, you get GURP scores, uh, and then you also get from the GenBank annotated files all the features. And, and this is an area that will continue to expand. Um, we'll mention we can bring more things into Seekman, but also ArraySTAR gives us custom importers. So if you've got files or databases that are, you know, maybe your own database of information or from a colleague or from another source, um, there are ways to even bring, you know, bring all these databases, you know, into our software. So again, SNP report is a great place um, to filter and to um, analyze SNPs. And so, of course, the databases that I mentioned are dbSNP, and when you, when you click on the SNP report, you can go directly to, there's a hyperlink directly to that, uh, using the RS number, which is up here in the corner. <coughs> Excuse me. And dbSNP, of course, contains all the additional information about that reference SNP. Uh, there's also the Cosmic Cancer Database, uh, and then the, the, the GURP uh, scores. And the GURP scores are great for, uh, because they occur in both coding and non-coding regions, and, you know, higher GURP scores indicate a higher degree of conservation amongst mammals, um, and potentially more interesting SNPs uh, when you have these higher GURP scores. So, again, this is some of the nice database linkage uh, that we're using right now. Um, but you can see with, with with SeekMan, um, it allows us to look at all the assemblies. Um, but when you start doing larger projects, or if I've got several thousand SNPs in each one of my samples, um, it's very difficult to manually go through and you know and look at a thousand different locations. You know, it's it's most people don't have uh, time or patience to do something at that scale. Uh, so you know, back uh, when we were developing our human genome assembler. Uh, we, we quickly realized there was a need to be able to assess the assembly and uh, to, to look at the SNPs that were found in one version of the assembler and then make some improvements and see, you know, did it get better, is it the same, and, and again, look at those variations, look at curated um, hat map data sets, you know, uh, exome and genome level, you know, to make sure that we're finding all the SNPs, so we, you know, you want to develop something that's, that's highly accurate as well. Um, and so, we developed some tools in ArrayStar in-house. ArrayStar has uh, um, a lot of capability for importing data files that are in, uh, you know, tab-delimited format, for instance, right? So we can we can import projects into ArrayStar, and it can be, you know, I say two to two hundred. We haven't tested above two hundred, but there's no reason to believe it can't go above two hundred. That's what our largest data sets are right now, and you can see I imported uh, my three ion torrent ampliceq cancer panels. Um, I could bring in and set this experiment up more sophisticated if I want. And so there's a little button up here um, in ArrayStar, and it says it allows me to import attributes, you know, for these experiments. So so I could go to a text delimited file and 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 point to that, and it'll bring up this wizard to say, well, what you know, which columns are interesting. And this looks like a control that I've used for my control set here. It's in different ethnic groups. Of, of human genomes, and so so I can bring in all different experiment attributes by defining um, um, my my data files that way. ArrayStar then allows me to you know filter across multiple samples now um, at much larger scales, and so it has its own filtering dialog. And what's very different about ArrayStar though is up here in the corner, um, I can filter at two different levels. I can filter at a gene level, or I can filter at a SNP level. So ArrayStar has uh, keeps track of things at gene level. So for instance, um, it might not be the precise position within a gene that's of a particular interest. I just want to know which genes have, you know, non-synonymous SNPs occurring in them, or you know, non-synonymous SNPs that introduce frame shifts or or um, make uh, nonsense. And so I can create a filter and get gene sets now in ArrayStar and then start doing analysis on genes. Um, so I have a couple different ways. I can filter gene level or SNP level. Um, and usually what we do with ArrayStar is apply filters and create interesting sets. And that's kind of what I've done here is I've 
applied a, a, a Smith level filter and I picked uh, one experiment here of my three and I just said show me all the non-synonymous Smith. So here's my filtering that I did. And I also said give me a p-value of at least 90 and a depth of 25. All right, and I said find all the SNPs in the FOS sample that meet these criteria. And down here in the corner of the window, um, there's 150 SNPs that meet that criteria. And, and here's a table now of that subset of SNPs. And I can see things like DB SNP, RS numbers, and GURP scores. So, so I can save that information by clicking a little icon here. So that's and save the results. And here's all the you know interesting SNPs for this sample. And I can do the same thing for all the samples um, and, and create sets of SNPs with the same filtering criteria. And then I can start to compare. It might be control versus cancer sets. So it's a really nice interface for creating these gene or SNP sets that I can then compare to each other. And so here is a, uh, a, a, a SNP table that I've created. And um, so I can analyze those SNPs from the sets that I've created and populate the columns now with some additional information. And so this is different than the SeqMan report in that now I have a summary at each reference position. So you can see I have a, 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 a SNPs in the KRAS gene highlighted. And so I have a GURP score, a relatively high GURP score, the reference sequence, and then I get the variant call for each of my three samples. So here's my, my three samples now are here. You know, so again, for a gene panel like the, this ion torrent AmpliSeq panel, you know, this might be all I need. I just may have a handful or a few dozen samples, and I know what gene I'm looking at, and I just see, you know, who's got the SNP and who doesn't. Um, I can also import additional information. So you see these extra columns here. I have a clinical association, a polyphen, allele count, observed genotypes, and, you know, my screen wasn't big enough that I could include more columns. This information... Um, I imported into a Raystar using one of the custom import wizards, and this came from, actually this came from a VCF file um, from an Exome variant server. And the VCF file is annotations associated, uh, you know, with specific, with specific uh, SNPs. And so if you have VCF files, you can bring them in, and they'll contain all sorts of information. In this case, clinical association, that's a link to OMIM, um, and then we have some polyphen information. So, you know, if you're pulling in this other information, ArrayStar has quick links um, to port that information into your project to facilitate analysis. And then once I create sets that are interesting, um, I can compare them to each other. Uh, I like to do Venn diagrams, uh, which, which are very simple. So again, these are our three data sets, um, and I can bring a control in and look at things, you know, SNPs that are just in the um, cancer data sets but not in the control or SNPs that are in common between all three and there's quick links down here in the bottom right where I can then convert so if I do a SNP search and find SNPs I can say well now show me the table of SNPs or I could say you know show me the table of genes so I can I can cross over from a SNP level to a gene level and in a star then I can bring in database information that's linked to the gene level and so gene level information, again, can be uh, a number of different things. Um, I'm showing a couple different options for gene level uh, annotation. This Go ID, ArrayStar has built-in connections to the Go consortium for all different organisms, and that will bring in things like ontology terms. So these are all functional and structural type uh, links of information so we can bring, and that are associated at the gene level. Um, so I can automatically port that into my ArrayStar project. And then these last columns out on the, out on the left, the right-hand side, are uh, this is just a custom file that I made. Um, and it, what it was is a set of, of genes that are known to be involved with prostate cancer. And um, so I loaded this file in, again, with the custom import wizard. And I can see that in my, my search here, my gene set, that one of the genes um, is showing up also in my, uh, my gene list. And so it's, a, again, a great way to you know, compare your filtering results in array star with known genes of interest, you know, in, for your type of analyses. So again, that, that's just um, another place I could go is things like ontology. Um, I, I don't have, uh, don't plan on showing that today, um, but that, that's a place that we could go as well.
So just a little bit of a summary now on, on DNA Star software. Um, the software is very flexible, you know, that accommodates different sequencing platforms and different types of workflows. Uh, we run great on budget computers. We run up on the cloud. You can run our assembler on a Linux cluster if you want. Um, and, and really we, we shoot for desktop computers that are um, relatively inexpensive. So, you know, under uh, $2,000 will get you all the hardware that you'd need. And we do all the different variant and, and genotype calling um, using Bayesian statistics uh, and calculate p-values, and that's all done up front in the assembler. And you know we get uh, uh, can enrich our, our reporting with dbSNP and Cosmic and GURP, VCF files, custom files that you may have. You know you can import those as well, um, as well as gene files that contain important gene lists. And, and and we can compare the variants you know at all different scales. It can be a couple of samples hundreds of samples. Um, it's easy to use and, and you know, I'd certainly recommend trying out a demo of the software if you haven't already. And, and, uh, and at this point, I, I think I'd just be happy to, to take some questions. Um, and I can stick around here and, and answer any questions. And if we don't have time today, we can certainly do questions uh, through email. Thank you.